React India. Sharing logic and state between web and mobile applications uh, with React Native. So uh, this is actually my second talk uh, in India this year. Uh, the first was back in July uh, at React Nexus in Bangalore. And uh, I have a very special place in my heart for the uh, Indian uh, React community. Uh, the enthusiasm, the curiosity, and just the sheer hospitality that I was met there was beyond phenomenal. Uh, and I'm excited to hopefully visit uh, India again soon. Uh, so uh, this talk uh, is, is really centered around uh, this concept of universal apps. Um, and uh, I want to take you, before we, before we jump into the actual talk, I want to take you through a story uh, of my trip to India and some of the complications before uh, I was able to, 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 to travel and, uh, and join Bangalore. So uh, let's jump into it. Uh, before we begin, just a little bit about me. So my name is Mo. Uh, I built my first mobile application when I was 13. Uh, it was a small app that prompted you to do something nice for the day. Uh, you know, take some flowers to a care home or, uh, you know, uh, give your parents a call or something like that. Uh, and then you had a little counter and it got incremented every single day once you did something good. So it was very wholesome. Um, now, did it have product market fit? No, but I was 13 and I was very proud of having that on the App Store. Fast forward to today now, uh, I'm currently heading the mobile team at this company called Theodo based in the UK. Uh, so we have over 150 mobile engineers uh, spread across the UK, France, Morocco, and the US. Uh, and so uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, around so many talented mobile developers and to, to learn and grow with them. Uh, and you may know us by another name. So BAM is our mobile team. Uh, we've built various open source projects like uh, the React Native Image Resizer Library and more recently Flashlight. So uh, this is all to just say that we are incredibly passionate about React Native and mobile development in general. Uh, so yeah, let's jump back into the visa uh, story and the travel story that I have. So uh, just for some context, I live in this uh, city called Edinburgh, based in the UK. Uh, here is a little visualization of it for you just to help you set the picture. Now, uh, this was back in July, a week before I was traveling. Um, I woke up uh, as I do every day and uh, I checked my phone for emails. And uh, I got an email from the conference organizer asking me to fill in a Google form. Now, uh, filling in Google forms on my phone is just a tedious process. So I opened up my laptop and lo and behold, there was a uh, icon on the dock that was saying, you've got mail open on your iPhone. Do you want to just open it up where you're at right now? And I went ahead and did that and it was instantly synced across to my mail app on the actual uh, Mac that I have. Now. I opened that up and then it opened up the form and I was able to transition from the use of my mobile phone to the computer. Now, this day passes on and I have still not heard back about my Indian visa. So I'm a bit stressed out. I'm meant to be traveling to India in about a week. Uh, so I decided to take matters into my own hands. Now, this is a odd choice and I would uh, advise against it strongly, but I Google searched where the consulate of India is in Edinburgh. Uh, and I found it on Google Maps, and so I decided, you know what, I'm going to uh, go and give them a knock and see if I can get an answer in person. Now, if anyone's ever tried this before, they will tell you that it's not a good idea, uh, and I wouldn't recommend doing it, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but then, as I got into my car, I opened up my phone, and I saw that the Consulate of India was already highlighted and available for me there. So the state had synced across from my laptop to my phone and vice versa earlier on in the day. So this is where, what this talk is really about. It's this concept of seamless integrations between web and mobile, where your state and your business logic and your functionality is synced. And we're gonna be talking about this in a bit more detail. Now, React Native is a core component in this. Uh, React Native was really revolutionary because it took the concepts that we knew about building UIs in React with a modern framework and a language that was declarative and brought it over to native mobile development. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people naturally saw that transition from web to mobile and they thought, well, why can't we just go back? Why can't we use React Native for the web as well as mobile? Uh, and that's really where React Native for web became uh, a thing. Uh, so Nicholas Gallagher uh, created React Native for web uh, not too long after React Native actually originally came out. Um, and so uh, it was a translation layer, a compatibility layer between React Native and the React DOM. Uh, so this was revolutionary because ultimately it took the paradigm that the React Native team has, which is learn once and write anywhere, and transformed it into a vision of write once and run anywhere.
And today we refer to these as universal apps, right? It's an app that can run on iOS, Android, but also can run on web. Maybe you can have a web extension or maybe it can be a desktop app, a TV app, whatever you may have, right? The, the, the list is endless here. Um, and there's been a lot of good work uh, happening in this space in the past couple of years. Namely, I'd say the biggest focus for people has been around uh, UI libraries, styling, and components. So two projects that I think are really uh, interesting to look at is NativeWind and Tamagui. NativeWind is a Tailwind implementation that works both on native-level mobile and also on the web. Uh, so it then delegates accordingly to whichever platform is using the styling. Uh, and Tamagui is a full-scale styling library that um, has a very optimized compiler to make sure that styles are efficient on web and mobile and has a set of predefined components that just work out of the box on web and mobile and respect the platform-specific uh, idiosyncrasies. So the, these are two great projects that have been worked on, and they're very actively being developed uh, in the, the universal styling and components and UI library spaces. So that's been a primary focus for people uh, in the React Native space when it comes to universal apps. On the other side, people have been really looking into navigation heavily. So one of the challenges is that navigation across web and mobile are fundamentally different things. On web, you've got a flat navigation hierarchy. Things are based off of URLs. Whereas on mobile, you're dealing with stacks, tabs, drawers, and modals, and whatever you may have, right? So these are just fundamentally different paradigms of navigation. And so there's libraries like Solido, which allow you to use navigation across Next.js and React Native projects, uh, but also uh, the newer Expo Router project is dedicated around bringing file-based routing to React Native in a way that is familiar to web developers who've been using Next.js's app router. So trying to unify these things and, and really formally define uh, a concept that can work for navigation across web and mobile. Now, smart people are working on these projects far smarter than I am. I actually want to dedicate my time to look at some of the less obvious parts, some of the boring parts. Things like, how can we share business logic and app config? How do we successfully share the API layers and the adapters? And most importantly, how do you actually share app state to get that seamless experience across web and mobile for users? So let's jump into business logic and app config. What can we share across business logic and app config? If we start looking at app config, firstly, we should be able to share things like API endpoints, any feature flags that we may have, any themes or localizations that exist. All of this should be should be really shared across the board. Um, so if you have a constants file where you define things like you know social media handles or maybe some feature flags, uh, what we'll then do is if you happen to want to extend this for a specific platform, you can simply spread that object that contains all of your constants and add anything that's specific to, uh, to a platform. So really, it's quite simple to share constants. It's nothing super exciting. It's nothing new, right? Um, now, I'm going to be bold here and make a statement that you should share your business logic across web and mobile. Now, why is that? Well, firstly, you want to reduce rework. There's no point duplicating, uh, duplicating logic across different platforms. Uh, and the more important bit, I think, is feature parity you want to ensure that your application behaves the same across all of the different platforms so that users don't have any surprises in, in store for them. Uh, and so it's really important to try to share business logic as much as possible and keep them centralized in one place that's being shared across platforms. So let's go through an example together. Uh, I'm going to be looking at writing some business logic for some checkout uh, of an e-commerce platform. Uh, so we have two functions here. One is validate UK postcode and another is uh, checkout. So what this is doing is it's uh, using a regular expression to test any string that comes in to make sure that it matches the UK postcode format. And then afterwards, uh, it checks out a specific user. It's just console.logging right now. We've stopped out the methods, but you kind of get the idea. Now, this is business logic that's just written in pure JavaScript. There's no React at the moment. But, you know, we can imagine how it would be Reactified. Uh, and the idea here is that we will take the checkout logic and the business logic and actually store them inside of a hook um, or inside of a class if it doesn't need access to any state or anything like that. Um, and so when you store it inside of this custom hook, effectively different implementations can just import in this hook uh, and use it uh, regardless of the platform. So you can see here we've got um, a function to validate UK postcode format is the same, and then the checkout format now uses some states that exist um, regarding the cart items and resets them. But all in all, all of this business logic is being encapsulated into a hook, and so that means that it's not sort of put in between screens and just like 
everywhere within your code base. It's centralized, it's within a hook, and this hook is reusable, so you can use them across web and mobile. So we've looked at business logic and app config, and we've decided we should be sharing these. Uh, it makes sense, and it reduces rework and ensures feature parity. Let's look at the API layer and the adapters. Can they be shared? Well, yes, you'll, you'll be making, by and large, the same calls to your backends, any external services, and you're going to be trying to handle caching uh, and transformation of the responses uh, the same. Uh, there's a great article on Martin Fowler's blog about modularized React architectures. I would highly recommend you read it. But in that, it talks about how you need to take out your API calls from all of the various places that they may be inside of your React application and put them inside of a fetcher layer. Uh, what that means is that that layer is acting as a service layer that sits in between any screens or any components that you may have, and that handles any fetching to external services or to backends and also transformation of that data. So it's important to isolate that away. Um, and so if you look at like an implementation with a library like React Query, uh, this can actually come quite naturally because you can take the use query API and store that um, as a custom hook. Um, and so it, it actually works quite well uh, in terms of standardizing your API calls and standardizing the caching behavior and standardizing how the responses are transformed. But perhaps the most interesting bit in terms of what can be shared is within the app state. So when you're modeling your app state, this is gonna be by and large the same. So the examples of this are things like user history. We looked at the example of my searches within the Maps application, uh, any user session state, but any local app customizations as well, like localization settings or display options, accessibility settings that have been toggled, dark mode, light mode, whatever you may have. So if we go back to the shopping example, uh, we would just transform that hook now, as an example, over to a uh, context. And so here we've got a, a demo context where it's a shopping cart provider. And so what this does is it, it has all of the same logic or it's slightly modified logic uh, inside of a context which will persist the state across the different components in our tree. So it's got cart, set cart, and a use uh, state. And then we, are, we have two functions or three functions, sorry, here. One is to add an item. One is to delete an item from the, from the shopping cart. And another is to check out, which will, you know, for now, just console.log, check out successful, and set the cart back to empty. Uh, so when we look at this here, the, uh, the, the functionality is kind of, uh, it doesn't matter what platform it's running on because it doesn't have any render logic, right? We stored all of our application state inside of this provider, and it is isolated away. So what that gives us the ability to do later is to take this and store it inside of a package let's call this package state for the sake of argument, but you can call it whatever you want. There can be many state packages for different parts of your application. And then using a mono repo tool like Turbo Repo, like NX, you will effectively be able to import them into multiple applications that you may have. So maybe you have a web app that's built with React and you may have a native app that's built with React Native. So you can then import them and use uh, a mono repo tool to really effectively manage that workflow. Uh, and this works great in a universal app because it's one single app that will be using this package, but it works, I think it's even more uh, more powerful when you're dealing with applications that are separated to start with. So if you already have an existing React app and you have an existing mobile app, they're not universal because of you know historical tech debt, you can still start to abstract away bits and bobs of it into these packages and that'll help you maintain feature parity and reduce the work that you're duplicating. So let's take a look at a demo of this. So we have a universal app here. What that means is that this app is running on the web and running on mobile at the same time. It's a very basic demo. It's going to just have a text input where you can search for something, click the go button, and it'll keep it in a list underneath to kind of show a search history of sorts, right? So just to show you how this would function, we'll say hello, that'll add it there, and we'll put goodbye here, that'll add it there. Now, the logic here is going to be shared. Let's take a look at that together now. So um, I've got my repo set up here. Uh, the repo is using Turbo Repo as a modern repo managing tool. And uh, within it, it's got two main packages that I want to focus on. One is called domain and another is called app. So domain is the encapsulation of all of our business logic, our state, and any of the domain that really needs to be separated out from the actual rendering. And we've got that here. So if you look here, we've got a package definition for domain, 
uh, and a main file that is defined as index.ts. We're gonna look at that in a second. And then on the right hand side, we have our app package.json. Now the app package.json actually ingests the domain as a dependency. It's got it listed as a dependency. Um, so we'll look at how those interact with each other in a second. Right, so if we jump into our index.ts for our domain package, um, we've got some very basic logic encapsulated inside of a hook called use search. So what does use search do? Well, it's got a history that's uh, just an array of strings and uh, a function to add search history. Uh, now, we want to actually be able to also delete the search history as a core functionality of this app. So what we're going to do is we're going to just define another, um, we're going to define another uh, method here define another function called uh, delete search history. We're going to make it a use callback uh, and it's not going to take any arguments in, um, but what it is going to do is it's going to simply call set history and it's going to define it as an empty array. Now we need to define our dependency array here as well. So we'll pass in history and set history uh, as our dependency arrays. Cool. Now, because this is all using this mono repo um, managing tool, sorry, we need to actually return that as well. Because this is using uh, Turbo Repo, uh, as soon as we update this, this will be available to our actual app package as well. And so what happens here is we have all of the types as well. So you can now see that there is a delete search history function that we can import from this hook. So let's go ahead and do that. And what I want to do is I want to add a button here. Um, so we're going to just, let's just copy the button that we have here for Go and we're gonna just change what it calls. So we're gonna just call delete search history here on the on press. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna change the text to say delete it all. Cool. So let's save that and go back to our apps and you can see that they're both updated. Um, so what I can do is hello. And here I can search for React India go great and then the delete functionality is available that business logic is already there across web and mobile right so the example that we looked at was a universal app but in theory this same approach will work inside of two separate applications one for web and one for mobile so we've encapsulated this away and we've created a package that is reusable um, in any places that we may need so this is just a very basic example but the benefits of this really start to show when you have large, large state that's being handled and you want to make sure that things are well defined, well modularized, uh, and it can be a really powerful tool to use on real projects. So I would highly recommend looking at this as a paradigm, uh, regardless of if you want to share across web and mobile. Okay, so we've looked at this demo. Now, what we haven't achieved here is really truly sharing state across web and mobile. What do I mean by that? Well, the states, logic was shared across web and mobile, but the actual state itself was still uh, on device for our phone or on the web, right? And what we want to see is it would be great if we could achieve a shared sort of state that is kept in sync to some degree uh, between our devices. Um, and the original idea for this came from a Twitter exchange that I had with Alex, the creator of TRPC, where he said uh, any usage of use state or use effect is actually a code smell. I thought that was a very odd statement. So I was like, how would you suggest people create React apps without use state or use effect? And the response was, you should put as much as you can on the back end. State on the front end shouldn't really exist much, right? Um, and that kind of checks out if we look at the Google Maps example that we had at the beginning of the talk the state of my search history is synced uh, by the cloud. It's going to be stored somewhere uh, on a backend. And so uh, there's this concept that you may be familiar with or, uh, called edge computing. And the idea is that you have a bunch of different locations spread around the world. Uh, these are close to user hot points. Uh, and the idea is that you will run uh, your compute and maybe your storage as well on the edge network. Um, and that means that there's reduced latency, usually if you're, you know, in an area that has high usage um, of, of, of uh, the internet, you'll be within, you know, 10, 15 milliseconds uh, of an edge location. So uh, Cloudflare Workers is an implementation uh, of uh, edge as a concept. Uh, and I highly recommend looking into it. It's a really cool space. It's a very sort of like on the edge, pun intended, space. So I would highly recommend um, taking a look into it. But 
if we take the concept of those modularized states that we had, those packages that we, we, we put all of our app state within, and we just push them to the back end and we leave them inside of the cloud, we can achieve something pretty cool. And that's where the second demo comes into play. Cool, so we have another search demo here and a uh, very similar concept here. I can search, say, hello, React India. And it keeps a track of the history. Now, what's different about this is that this one is actually storing all of the state on the back end using Cloudflare's Edge. So we're gonna take a look at that together. So uh, the way that this project is set up uh, just very quickly is it's split into just a normal React Native project that also has a server uh, folder uh, underneath it. Um, and so this is using workers and any um, any file that has worker.ts as an extension will be recognized as a Cloudflare worker. So it's like server side code. Now this is using a uh, like an open source wrapper that me and a friend of mine from Cloudflare built together. Uh, so uh, it's very cool if you're interested in that, look up worker functions with a dash in between and you can find uh, more details on how this works. Um, but the nice thing about this is that um, I have the server code and my front end code living in one uh, repository. Uh, and that comes with a whole host of cool stuff added onto it. Now, uh, you can see that we've got some of the logic living inside of this index.worker.ts file. And uh, there's functions like get search history, add search history, and I've written a clear search history that we're gonna uncomment in a second. Um, but one of the benefits of keeping them all in one repository is that we get type safety across the board, which is really cool. So um, we've just instantiated a worker client here, and then we just make calls to uh, worker.add search history to be able to invoke this method across the wire, which is uh, very cool if you ask me. So uh, what that comes with though, is um, it comes with things like IntelliSense. So if I wanted to add a search, uh, every time you get the search history, if I wanted to like um, make a call, uh, I could do worker and you can see it already has add search history and get search history here, which is very powerful. Um, but one of the things that it also means is if I were to uncomment, if I were to comment get search history here, you can see I've automatically got myself some error saying that this doesn't exist as a type. So it's got that all those nice benefits there. So you've got this sort of like workflow where all of these things live together and it doesn't feel like you're coding on the server as much um, as it could. So uh, it, it feels very unified. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, uncomment this clear search history, uh, just to run you through what this code is doing right now. Uh, it is uh, getting a hold of a database that lives in Cloudflare's Edge uh, called D1, and then it basically runs a SQL command to delete from searches. And then it will you know, do some error handling that's very badly coded, and then will uh, return the history to the front end. So let's go ahead and save that. Uh, and I'm gonna uncomment this function on the front end that calls clear. Cool. So all of this is doing is it's a use callback. It calls worker.clear search history and then sets the history to whatever the response is from, from the back end side, which should be an empty list. And then we're going to go here. Um, I have a button just there to clear. So let's do that. And we're going to go on here and refresh the website. And we see hmm, that's there. So if we click clear search history, that will get rid of uh, our search history that exists. Now, this is very much the same functionality so far. We've only unlocked the same functionality as we had in the previous demo. But what ends up being really cool is if I put hello React India, and then I also put um, name is Mo, and I put that there, and I open the same app up on my mobile, what you'll see is that it fetches the state from there, which is so cool. Now, we, with very minimal coding, we've got synced state across the board, um, and that's quite powerful. So if we then invoke clear search history from this side, it updates itself, and if we were to refresh the page on the website, all of that search history is gone as well. So this state is synced across the board between the two. The next natural step would be to add WebSockets, but just for the sake of this demo, we've kept it with simple HTTP requests uh, that are... Uh, that are just being run sort of when when the user requests them. But an extremely powerful paradigm to have that synced state across the board, um, all done with very, very minimal added complexity. And one thing that's really important to highlight here is that the time to make these requests are not very long at all. Um, so this is connected to the edge that's closest to me, probably one in Scotland or maybe one in London even. Um, but you know, 
the time here is quite minimal to add it. So you wouldn't block this, you would add some, maybe some loading stage or something, but in theory, all of this can be done quite quickly over the wire. Nice, so that is the final demo. Let's do a quick recap of what we've covered today. Firstly, modern apps come with this expectation from our users that we sync state seamlessly between web and mobile. If you look at the way that the Apple ecosystem is set up or Google's ecosystem is set up, a lot of the expectation is that these apps will do a lot of syncing behind the scenes for you so that the user doesn't even have to think about it. And it's an expectation that is there within the modern user base. We've learned that in practice, you can actually share most of your app's config, some of the logic and the state. These are things that you should be sharing because it will maintain feature parity and reduce the amount of work that you need to do. We've looked at monorepo tools. We've seen that these can actually streamline this process quite a bit. Um, and lastly, we've talked about how you can push as much data as you can to the server side and that the edge is a powerful solution to avoid boggling down your existing backend with too much of this sort of like ephemeral logic, um, but it can be a really powerful close to the user backend that you can use for some of these functions like search histories and any of the app state. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to listen to this. Uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to uh, shoot me a message either on Twitter or the app formerly known as Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, those are the QR codes and you can just scan them. Uh, and I hope to be with you in person uh, at Goa next year in React India.